Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second day of this Chatham House conference. Please, if you could make your way uh, rapidly to your seats, and we'll, uh, we'll begin. My name's Andrew Jack from the Financial Times. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm told that um, you're all very kind of uh, opinionated and enthusiastic, so we're looking forward to a discussion that will begin a little bit with our great panel here, but I want to flip it open to you pretty quickly so we can have a good interactive session over the next um, 50 minutes or so. So, um, very topical issue. We're talking about healthcare coverage, um, and particularly the issue of the relationship between the role of the public and private sector. Our official title, Access to Healthcare, Aligning Business Goals and Social Outcomes. Um, plenty to say on this. This is Chatham House, of course, so we're um, very much interested in the comparative approach and some of the different um, high spots and low spots perhaps around the world, thinking about lower and middle income and higher income countries, different models perhaps from each that can cross fertilize and big gaps to try to move towards the objectives of the Sustainable Development Goals and improved health outcomes for all. Um, but let's just start with, with, with some introductory reflections perhaps for all our, our panelists here, just thinking about that balance, you know, what is perhaps the, in all of your perspectives, the optimal balance or the relative roles that can be made between the public and the private sectors? Maybe start with you, Simon, of course, who's got deep experience both in the US as well as the NHS. Yeah, well, in this country, as everybody knows, we uh, have made a choice, a choice that we are happy with, uh, to have a publicly funded uh, national health service. And we, as the NHS, are one of the few institutions in this country that is more popular 70 years after our foundation <laughs> than we were at the get-go. And we just had that sort of big discussion uh, last summer and have uh, sort of doubled down on the idea that we're going to need to uh, improve uh, funding again over the next uh, five years and beyond in order to sustain that. Um, but uh, because we have a, a health service in this country where care is available based on your need, not ability to pay, uh, the fact, however, still is that for any country's health system, a lot of the medical innovation will be uh, set outside of uh, the health uh, service itself. Uh, some will come from uh, the life sciences sector. Some will spill over from bigger technological shifts, and those are generally uh, in the private sector uh, rather than in the public sector. So uh, all healthcare is a combination of uh, inputs from uh, different, uh, different uh, elements. Uh, but the uh, principal question facing most industrialized countries now is how do you get more join up between the components of care? Because the disease burden has changed, uh, social expectations have changed, the possibilities of medicine have changed. So integration is the name of the game uh, rather than component wear. And although we're coming from different traditions, I would argue every uh, industrialized country is really trying to figure that out. So, so Mike uh, from MSD, from the States, although obviously with a global remit, what's your sense about where the right balance is? is does the US have the right balance between public and private? I'm not sure the US healthcare <laughs> system is the model that uh, the rest of the world wants to uh, adopt. But the, the, the reality is, is that, you know, I think from the private life science sector, you know, when we think about things, right now we're at this amazing era of unprecedented science, unprecedented health gains. And when you think about, you know, infant mortality rates around the world going down substantially, when you think about um, duration of, of cancer treatments and, and life expectancy, last week we had an opportunity to present data in non-small cell lung cancer where survival rates were quintupling versus previous standard of care, giving people hope that no, you know, was previously unimaginable. Um, we see these huge gains, but what's accompanying with these gains are huge challenges. And a lot of the technologies that are starting to be brought to the market by the private sector that Simon alluded to are really creating a, a, a chance for a fundamentally different partnership between the public and private sectors. Um, the reality is, is that um, with some of the curative therapies that are on their way, if we don't find a way to operate differently, we are gonna have a really hard time. And, and as an organization who invests roughly about 10 billion US dollars a year in research and development, um, you know, we are committed not only to the short-term access challenges, but the long-term. And I think that's the, one of the fundamental tensions that we're constantly wrestling with is, you know, how do you provide the right access today while making sure there's a foundation for tomorrow's innovations? And so the only answer we've kind of, uh, you know, come across is through 
close partnerships. It's through close dialogue. Um, you know, we've had, I've had the benefit of, of working in the UK, um, finding new ways of introducing cancer medicines into the UK that ultimately benefit uh, the patients we're all commonly serving. And so, you know, as we think about it on a global basis, I think um, partnership is the name of the game in this space. So Robert, chat about, so you, you spend a lot of time looking at different systems around the world and the role of universal health coverage. Mm -hmm. What's your sense? Where, where are some of the bright spots and the low spots, perhaps? Well, I think the great thing about universal health coverage is it gives us a common framework and vision uh, that everyone signed up to this now through the Sustainable Development Goal. So there's no argument now that all countries are trying to achieve this goal of everyone getting the health services they need with financial protection. So then you say, well, how are we going to achieve this? And recognizing that there are enormous market failures in healthcare, that if you just leave it to a free market and regulate it, you'll never get that goal. Uh, basically because it only healthy, wealthy people would get the services, not the sick and the poor. I think in terms of the, the roles of the public and private sectors, Julio Frank, the former Mexican uh, health minister, had a great way of looking at this, saying, if you look at the big four functions, really, of governance, financing, service provision, and manufacturing inputs, then you can sort of see the relative strengths. When it comes to governance, that's got to be the public sector. Setting the rules, you know, that's a societal decision. It's got to be the public sector. When it comes to the financing as well, it's got to be predominantly public financing. I think this is the big recognition that to achieve universal coverage, the state needs to be involved, forcing the healthy wealthy to cross-subsidize the sick and the poor, and also being involved in decisions about allocating resources. So you only really achieve universal health coverage in a publicly financed uh, health system, and hopefully that's the direction the United States will move to, uh, hopefully in the not too distant future. But then, uh, then it starts getting interesting because when it comes to service provision, it might be a bit more of a toss-up, you know. And, and you know that in, even in the NHS, we have quite a lot of private provision, th things like hospice services. You might even say our GPs are private practitioners, and many countries have successfully achieved UHC with a mixed public and private providers. Now, when it comes to manufacturing the inputs, I think we basically learned that the governments aren't very good at making things and in innovating. And that's where the private sector is, is going to have the, the lion's share of the responsibility in inventing things and making things more efficiently, but always remembering that goal of universal coverage, that there should be full pr financial protection and services should be affordable. So we can't have the situation of, of companies charging exorbitant prices uh, and the state is needed to, to restrict um, overzealous pricing, should I say, and making sure that the benefits reach everyone. So, so Michelle, <coughs> at the World Health Organization, particularly with your director general now, there's been a real focus on universal health coverage. What, what, what are you seeing as the, the challenges in really getting countries to commit and scale up in that direction? Well, what we want to do really is be able to deliver on the SDGs and the new strategy, what we call the triple billion strategy, is really focused on delivering where do we have to be in 2023 if we want to achieve the SDGs in 2030. And for universal health coverage, we have to have one billion more people under universal health coverage, which is a huge objective. But this is realistic and we must achieve it. So we work mostly with countries, of course, with member states, because they are also our governance and they are the governments we work with. And I do agree that there's a lot, uh, we, we estimate an 85% 80 of financing would be domestic funding into realizing uh, universal health coverage. And a number of countries are making huge progress on that. India, Indonesia, Kenya, uh, Rwanda, Nigeria, they're all on track to delivering and we're trying to help them with that. But it's clear that if we want to deliver on the SDGs, and in particular on universal health coverage, we have to work with all partners and we have to engage with all partners, including private sector and communities and others. And you just mentioned the areas, indeed, where we need to engage together in terms of um, uh, health uh, workforce, in, term, in terms of uh, innovation, service delivery, and a number of uh, areas where we need to rely also on a good cooperation um, with private sector. As you know, WHO is a normative agency, and of course we have to protect this normative role and make sure that we don't have undue influence. And our member states gave us a framework for that called FENSA, framework for engagement with non-state actors. And um, Dr. Tedros wants to give it dynamism in the sense that it's a framework for engagement. We have clear red lines, but we can also engage into developing and making sure that we 
have a, a very strong partnership. I would just quote an example, but there are many others. For example, in the current Ebola outbreak, we do work a lot with the new vaccines that have been developed, and that really makes a difference in the situation in trying to, uh, to help the outbreak really become uncontrollable. I mean, obviously, there are other issues that we have to deal with that are more probably in um, conflict zone areas, security areas, and others. But the work we do with the, with the private sector there is certainly making a difference compared to the previous outbreak. So, David, is there a, a tension around the private sector's involvement in healthcare delivery? Would you like to see the kind of the, uh, the boundaries shifted some? I think obviously the answer, Andrew, is yes. That if you've got bright and able people like Simon trying to get the biggest bang for your buck today to maximize the health gain generated by tax-funded payments today, and you've got bright and able people like Mike thinking about developing better cancer treatments, etc., wanting in the long term to get effective treatments. And whatever you say about exorbitant prices, the ultimate rate of innovation is related to the amount of money going in publicly and privately then there is going to be a degree of tension. I think in this country, the relationship isn't bad, although it disappoints me. The quality of public dialogue disappoints me intensely from time to time. I went to a meeting in the Crick over there, that great temple to cancer research you can see out of the window. And especially a lot of the young researchers, the belief that somehow the industry was ripping them off, taking their research, putting all the money in coffers which none of us have access to, disappointed me. I could understand it, but I think the quality of dialogue could be a lot fairer, a lot better informed. I think that's partly down to industry. I think it's partly down to public and international agencies. It's partly down to universities taking the money from industry, but then not defending the people they're working with. So I've been working on cancer um, recently. It's a good example of, of the tensions which come up. We know we've got a growing problem as countries go through demographic transition, cancer gets more prevalent. Um, about 30% of all deaths in the UK now in countries like the UK, about 10% of all deaths in India. Um, we know that the public worldwide wants better treatments. It's a high priority of people. There's plenty of evidence if you want to go into that. The good news is we're unpacking biology at the moment. So the probability isn't 0.5, it isn't 0.7. The probability is one that within a few decades we can either effectively cure or contain and treat effectively nearly all cancers in nearly everybody aged younger than me, so people under 80. Um, the bad news, of course, is there's great tension about these thoughts about affordability, about access. And the access is, is, relates to prevention, it relates to early diagnosis, it relates to availability of surgery, worldwide skilled manpower, woman power. Um, it's partly about drugs, although in a sense that the, the drugs which are really important are there are moments cheaper than the ones that are on the experimental edge. Can we do better? I won't bore on now, but obviously focusing on the integrity of a rules-based intellectual property system worldwide with assuring appropriate access in poorer countries is one huge one. For me, another, where are most cancer deaths? The 80% the of all cancer deaths now plus are in people aged over 60. In this country, there's only a few hundred child cancer deaths um, by child people under 20. But of course, what drives public concern is often the thought of the young. How do we in rich countries really appropriately diagnose and treat older people? The NHS does a great job, as I'm sure Simon will agree. But at the same time, I know the quality of cancer care for many people, even in the UK, leaves a lot to be desired on a lot of fronts. So those are sort of big issues. A final tweak, if I may, that on health economics that I was part of, I joined that York Health Economist group in the early 70s. I've seen it develop to this quali-based ideology. My argument with it is, is very much like um, was being discussed last night, not least by Martin, um, 
about the difference between the long term and the short term. At the moment, our economic approaches tend to be fragmented, individual treatment based, looking at what I as an individual want, whereas we know most people's preferences relate to their families, their communities, and their longer term. I fear that we're under some pressure getting back to public and private. It's the balance between the long term and where we can get to if we work together logically and the short term of maximizing things today, which is fine, but if it sacrifices the future, it's not worth it for me. So there's, <coughs> there's a couple of trade-offs there, and cancer's a good <coughs> way perhaps to come back and look at them, isn't it? Um, one between you know, the argument that perhaps there's a drive towards excessive medicalization and the move towards drugs and treatment versus prevention. Lung cancer, of course, would be a classic case, wouldn't it? And the second thing is whether even within the choice of disease areas, uh, cancer in particular because of the huge prices, very frankly, very lucrative niches, that, um, that's really driving a squeeze out of research and development of products in a lot of other areas, even if we're looking at the treatment space alone. I mean, Simon, do you think, I mean, you know, the UK is a classic example, isn't it? The Cancer Drug Fund, which was bluntly a political ruse to precisely push aside NICE and attempts to look at cost as well as clinical e efficacy um, because cancer is seen as such a sort of politically mobilizing um, disease. But does it, does it end up distorting what would be the better priorities in a healthcare system, largely because of a sort of drive towards, you know, for profit um, development of new drugs in certain areas? Um, well, if we start with the kind of worldwide disease burden and then think in uh, Western countries, what are we facing with? I think one of our biggest, mis uh, the biggest opportunities that it would be great to see some further scientific progress on over the next uh, decade or so would be uh, neurodegenerative diseases, particularly uh, also thinking about uh, dementias. And on you know, one estimate, uh, dementia is costing about 1% of worldwide GDP right now. Uh, the innovation rate or the successful innovation rate uh, amongst uh, dementia treatments and cures uh, is minusculely low. And if you were able to get that right, then you would be able to, frankly, uh, repurpose a huge amount of uh, public and private cost, which is currently spent up uh, in having to look after my parents' generation uh, in care homes and other long-term care systems. So there's a huge opportunity there, which is only going to grow not only in uh, countries such as uh, Germany, the UK, uh, Japan, but also China. I mean, China obviously has, a, 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 in absolute terms, uh, a large number of uh, aging citizens. And so I, I do think that uh, dementia uh, is an area that will repay huge uh, dividends uh, if the science uh, begins to work. Uh, Secondly, we've got old problems reasserting themselves. Everybody here who's followed these debates will know the problem of antimicrobial resistance uh, as one of the uh, sort of key global health threats. Uh, there is interesting work done to, been done to think about how to structure the right incentives for uh, new uh, products there, even if they're not then put into use. But on cancer per se, I'm actually quite optimistic about where uh, cancer innovation is taking us, and it will be of great benefit to the public if, if that happens. Look, uh, for people born since 1960, I think it is in this country, you've got a one in two lifetime risk of getting cancer. Cancer is becoming a chronic condition. It is heavily geared towards, uh, it's, a, it's associated with an aging population, so we're going to have more new cases at the same time as cancer survival is at an all-time high. Uh, and I think to your question, Andrew, on cancer specifically, it's got to be both and. We've still got around six million smokers uh, in this country. Uh, we absolutely need to continue to tackle uh, those well-established uh, causes of cancer. But equally, when you think about uh, the big uh, tumor types, uh, cancer cases, we've got an opportunity to do a lot better on bowel cancer uh, and lung cancer uh, treatments through earlier diagnosis. If we see some of the science which looks to be promising around, uh, say, liquid biopsies or other ways of tracking not only those uh, major, uh, in volume terms, cancer types, but also uh, cancers such as pancreatic, where the uh, survival rate is perhaps 6%. I mean, that would be a leapfrog uh, for a number of those cancers. Ovarian would probably be true as well. And certainly from the point of view of the NHS, I mean, we are willing to pay uh, quite significant uh, amounts per patient for what are genuine cures. Uh, we were the first uh, health service in uh, Europe 
to approve within 10 days of uh, its marketing authorization, uh, so-called CAR-T therapies, uh, last, last autumn. Uh, and they are potentially curative. I think we're going to see cartel, uh, CAR-T type uh, therapies coming to solid tumors. Uh, we're going to see uh, tumor agnostic uh, therapies uh, getting their marketing authorizations you know, within the next uh, six to nine months. So I think we're seeing a lot of innovation in cancer and frankly that is good. But what we've also got to do is uh, go upstream and do both uh, the prevention as well as the uh, early diagnosis and then the therapy. And there's no contradiction between those, in my opinion. I mean, uh, Mike, of course, uh, Merck has uh, um, one or two very important vaccines around um, cancer prevention. But yeah. nonetheless, I don't know what your, you know, your distribution of R&D is, but I suspect if it's sort of typical of the industry, it's very heavily skewed into yeah. cancer increasingly. You know, and albeit what Simon says about the potential for cure, you know, bluntly, a lot of cancer treatments still are quite incremental, aren't they? Life extension in a lot of cancers is often a matter of a few months on average, and yet the resources going into it are enormous. Do you think there is a, a mismatch there? Are there some, some, some different incentives that might redistribute the efforts of pharma research? Yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, a company like Merck or MSD is, is purely oriented around the science. And the, and the simple reality is our understanding of biology of cancer is ahead of our understanding of biology of neurodegenerative diseases. And so for the industry, you know, we all can see what the great unmet needs are. And, and you know, I can tell you, every life science company would love to have the right intervention for Alzheimer's disease. But the reality is we don't understand the disease in a fundamental state. And so to put research into those, some of those areas is a speculative endeavor. The reality is, you know, we've tested um, a number of different Alzheimer's compounds. And the reality, we tested a hypothesis that everyone kind of thought was kind of the future, the beta amyloid hypothesis. It turned out it didn't work. And so, you know, these sort of failures obviously help advance the science, but the reality of it is the life science industry and the reason cancer is, you know, receiving a disproportionate investment on one hand is the return, but on the other hand, it's just the fundamental understanding of basic science. And I think, you know, for us, you know, as we look at where we invest resources, it's always on the scientific frontier. If we have a hypothesis, we are disease area agnostic, to be honest with you, and we go to where the science is. If, and if we can bring the capabilities of our organization to bear on a challenge, and the Ebola challenge was one of those challenges we recognized we were a unique provider in the, in the vaccine space. We understood how to scale up Ebola vaccine. And it's that vaccine that's now being deployed in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Uganda to help control this. So it, it's a question of where capability sits, but also where the underlying understanding of science is. And on the prevention side, we agree wholeheartedly. Um, a lot of our effort is also how do we take some of these vaccines that could actually have huge societal benefit. And we're starting to see that in places like Scotland and places like the UK broadly, um, in Australia, where we're seeing real reductions in precancerous markers through you know, enhanced vaccination programs. But all of that always comes with a host of other preventative measures. And I think that balance between prevention and treatment is really, really critical. And obviously, you know, for you know, humanity, the more we can prevent, the better off we all are. So, Rob, and in, in the fourth bucket of Julio Frank categories that you were describing so eloquently there, the manufacturing, which I suppose one could broaden to talk about medical inputs, mm -hmm. how much do you think is that skewing, distorting, limiting the aspiration, particularly in lower and middle income countries, to move towards UHC? Uh, and this is, the, this is the big issue, the, you know, about the allocation of resources. And if you look at the big numbers of where people haven't got health coverage at the moment, you know, they're in India, Pakistan, Indonesia, Nigeria. They're all spending about 1% of their GDP in public health spending. And, th and there are lots of people who basically aren't getting any health care or very little health care. Each of those countries have said they're going to spend about another 1% of GDP to try and reach universal coverage. So it is vital that those countries really do allocate those resources to have maximum impact so that everyone benefits and you get the, the maximum health benefits. And you can see that if the money gets skewed too much towards very high-tech inpatient hospital care and not being spent on basic access to medicines and, and you know, the vital uh, things that are going to keep people alive, that's a huge problem. 
not only for the population's concern, but we've mentioned things like AMR, you know, that, that to have lots of people not getting access to, say, TB medicines, um, you know, whilst a lot of money is being spent on, the, on very expensive, you know, cancer care services is, is not good for any of us. And this is why I think these, you know, debates that are ongo um, ongoing in, in countries like India at the moment are, are, are very, very important. The Indian government has announced that it's going to uh, um, launch these big health reforms, but it's tending to focus on inpatient hospital care and ensuring people against that. Now, that sounds like a really sort of great deal for the Indian population to get access to these, these big private hospitals, but it's about 70% of out-of-pocket expenditure is actually on medicines at the moment. So you would be hoping that the focus will be much more on a primary healthcare driven approach. So I, I, I think it's beholden on all of us to look at the cost effectiveness of your, of your best buys, looking at the burden of disease, and um, you know, what might be appropriate for the incremental increase of say, a billion or so pounds spent on the NHS won't be the same as it is in say South Africa or, or India at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, Michelle, what can the WHO do to help coordinate potentially that sort of relative best buy assessment in different countries? And also, you alluded earlier to the, the, you know, the relative voice or place of private sector industry within and around the WHO. How is that relationship evolving? Well, I, I entirely agree with what has just been said in terms of how to, uh, to advise countries on health spending and how to make sure that if you want to achieve universal health coverage, you definitely have to make sure that primary health care really is at the foundation and that's what uh, all countries should, should develop. Obviously, it implies a lot of work with private sector in terms of, uh, um, well, if you want to have a, a, a good primary health care systems, you have to have access to quality, accessible, affordable um, drugs and quality, I would stress also. So we have to make sure that all the innovative drugs would get to the countries in time. You can't have a primary health care that works if you don't have that basis. And so that means a lot of collaboration, discussion, engagement. We are indeed in WHO developing an engagement strategy with the private sector just to make sure that we can try and solve those issues together, that we can discuss. We have regular discussions with the uh, a business association, IFPMA and others, um, to try and see how to regulate that. There was a, new, a resolution passed at the World Health Assembly, as you know, um, recently on transparency on the price of um, health products and also on clinical trials, by the way. Uh, and that was a request from member, our member states to understand more about the processes. Actually, many discussions we had also during the World Health Assembly with the health ministers from a number of countries was around um, um, market failures and how can we address those market failures? What can we do? So many of them were discussing, can we increase pooled procurement, for example, to make sure that many countries can benefit from um, sort of better prices, more affordable prices. Um, we discussed also possible local production development and a number of different areas where um, we can try and, and make sure that we, we broaden the scope and we, we can address those market failures. And basically what we're very interested in also is trying to make sure that innovation gets really quickly to the, um, the countries in need. Uh, we work, for example, a lot with Unitaid, uh, a hosted partnership within WHO to develop those really um, innovative, um, to bring these innovative new uh, products or interventions to, uh, to the field as quickly as possible at affordable prices. Simon, I can't resist just briefly coming back on that transparency point. We were discussing it earlier. Is that the right way to go? You know, does one want much more transparency as was being pushed in that resolution for pricing and cost of drugs? Well, I think we certainly want transparency of value assessment and we want transparency of the way in which individual countries or health systems then uh, go about uh, negotiating uh, their prices. Uh, but I, I think we also, uh, if we think about the sort of uh, worldwide differential in the per person health spending, need to recognize that uh, there needs to be differential price points uh, if people in poor countries are going to be able to get medicines uh, not just paying German prices or American prices. So if transparency is really a way of trying to converge on a global average price, that will be a 
bad deal for a lot of people around the world. So the question really is, uh, how do we sort of square that circle? We, we, we obviously have very transparent value assessment in this country uh, through NICE, including these days with the Cancer Drugs Fund, Andrew. Uh, but uh, we also have the ability to do uh, commercially in confidence uh, pricing arrangements with individual manufacturers. And that enables us to drive good value for uh, British patients. David, I'm going to open it up in just one second, so please start coming up with your questions. But so just one final provocative thought before we do that on, you know, what would you see? Provocative. Two provocative thoughts, <laughs> go on then. That, that obviously sensibly before being provocative, prevention. My father died of lung cancer about 60 years ago when I was 15. The first time the tobacco industry tried to farm it was in 75. So I believe in prevention. The trouble is most cancers aren't preventable. Um, public expenditure across the world on universal health care, of course, good primary health care systems for whole hospitals. But I'll rise to the bait that you obviously have been dangling, Andrew, that if we look, for example, at the cost of medicines in a country like this one for the past 50 years, they've accounted for about 10% of health spend, care spend. That's broadly true if you do the figures properly for most developed countries. In less developed countries, they've been falling as a proportion of healthcare spend, although the figure might be higher now, about 20% of healthcare spend. Why? You and I are expensive. Hopefully, as we get older, we get more expensive. And what's more, if we employ 10 of us, we cost 10 times as much. Something that you can produce industrially with relatively low production costs, even if it's a big, complicated molecule at the margin, obviously you get huge savings to scale. And over time, those technologies become free to humanity for the rest of time. What we're doing with the biological sciences now, dementia, cancer, the whole thing, Simon, is all one thing. We're unpacking the fundamental biology. We will be able to deliver. We've talked a lot ambitiously about AI in this conference. The real impact over the next half century on world production of energy, if we're going to fix carbon dioxide, much less helping us to survive cancer, not get dementias, etc. That biological science investment is to me even more important than me being treated for some foul disease. So that was one set that we're undermining it. On dementia, I work with John Hardy at UCL on dementia. I know the difficulties they've got. The point is now the opportunities we're unpacking immediately when you're actually dying from these things, you rather want, if you can, to prioritize the things we can do something about first. Which isn't to say, if you go through demographic and epidemiological transition, obviously you do infectious disease first, you do cardiovascular, which if we use what we've got in cardiovascular, we can virtually eliminate, apart from some congenital conditions, by just using what we've got better. We're still not doing very well with that. We're biting the cancers, and then for me, the next shell of the onion will be neurological disease. What else is there important to say? The three-month tease. The end of the 70s onwards, we started unpacking gene drivers in cancer. We've got the bright idea, if you can find the proteins specific to some cancers and block them, we cure them. We got lucky with some things like Gleevec and Matinir being chronic myeloid leukemia. If it doesn't cure, it holds it up for a decade or two or three. In lots of these things, what happens is you did the fundamental research, very well intended, but the cancers are much more complex than we knew now. The work going on over there has told us why they can get around the treatments. We're now at the test of taking that toolbox, which is rapidly going out of patents, and putting it together in combinations with other therapies so the three-month jibe just comes from people who haven't got sympathy with the story. So that's rising to your, your <laughs> bait. Right. If you want another, a final swipe. We'll come, yes. we'll, we'll come one up one oh. last swipe. Oh. Transparency. <laughs> transparency, what a lovely word. Um, who could be against transparency? Um, I transparently talk too much. But <laughs> if <laughs> Ramsey pricing... Um, there was a guy called Frederick Ramsey who died of kidney disease in the, the 30s um, at the age of 27. We can easily treat it now. But one of his real contributions before he died in his 20s was to say in any world market, especially where you've got low 
marginal cost of production, you price higher in rich markets than you do in the, uh, the poor markets. That's clearly what we need with these medicines. And I tie intellectual property law to a responsibility to have Ramsey pricing. The trouble is if you tell most people, especially in countries like Germany, I do know the public opinion data on this, that somebody else is getting something cheaper. If you tell Mr. Trump that somebody else is getting something cheaper, you're in deep problems. Because the trouble with the transparency in the World Health Assembly is that it will torpedo the opportunities. What Mr. Trump wants when he says he wants lower prices in America, he doesn't necessarily want lower prices, especially when you understand the discounting pattern they've got there. But what he does want is higher prices in Europe. He does want higher prices elsewhere. The belief in transparency, unless you really understand the politics underneath it, is very dangerous. Okay, thanks. So let's uh, open it up. Who, uh, so goodness, we have lots of questions. Um, perhaps we can start in the front. Is there a microphone? And do please uh, just briefly introduce who you are, please. And, and uh, qu short questions, please. Okay, hi, Trisha de Borgra, uh, GWL Strategic Partnering. I, I wanted to come um, on following a little bit about what you've been saying. Do you think, you, you guys, do you think that treating old age as a treatable non-infectious disease would help meet uh, needs of older populations by closing that phase of uh, and then freeing up, you know, making older populations much more contributory and active, uh, but looking at it as a treatable disease. Who wants to have a go? Try to get this back in. Obviously close to my heart, the definition of an emeritus professor is UCL. He should be dead, but he won't give us the office back. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, obviously, when Major was talking about dependency ratios yesterday, he was failing to say, we can help people be healthy in their 60s, help people be healthy and contribute. I want to go on contributing my 70s. Whether I should treat aging as a disease or a, a biological reality, if I get cancer, that for me is a disease and abnormality. If I gently fall apart, well, that's difficult to understand, but if I get dementia, that for me is a disease. I would rather call the conditions diseases rather than the inevitable state of humanity where we're here for a very brief time and then we cease to be for all eternity. I think you have to accept that. I wouldn't call aging a disease. Mm -hmm. yeah, please, Michelle. Uh, actually, this is a, a topic that you know, works with others at, um, very intensely. And we, have, we are now starting a decade for healthy aging. And we're really trying to look at aging from a different angle. Um, first of all, we have more of the, um, an overview of a, a sort of a lifelong um, prevention and health promotion policy, which means that people can age um, with a better health, because of course w what we say is we should not add only years to life, but life to years so that people can continue doing what they like over that period of time. But that, that implies a change in mindset in the way we consider old age, and there's a lot more activities, there's a lot more contribution that old age could give to society and probably keep them also going in a better way. It's also um, in cities, for example, when you're looking at your transport system, you're looking at your everything in the city, I mean, every aspect, is to make it more accessible. And we had discussions recently on that. Um, some people were asking, are we going to have a silver tsunami, like it's going to overwhelm us? And uh, we think we can have a silver dividend, provided that we have the right health pre prevention promotion policy, the right mindset, and also the right infrastructures around to help people continue being leading an active life. Okay, I'm gonna, yeah, please, one at the back there. Thank you. Rob Breck here, Chatham House. Um, with the global rollout of universal health coverage, how do we ensure that all vulnerable groups are captured by these policies? And as an example, in England, we know that there's increasing concern around the access to healthcare for undocumented migrants and failed asylum seekers, uh, to the point where all the medical royal colleges in this country are calling for the charging regulations in the NHS to be suspended because of the concerns to the public and individual health. So I guess it would be great if Simon could comment on this specific issue in England, but as we roll out universal health coverage globally, how do we ensure that vulnerable populations are included and that these policies really are universal? Okay, Simon. Okay, so taking that in two parts. Uh, on the first part, uh, 
you're right that concern has been expressed. Uh, people get uh, free access to uh, primary care and to emergency care, but for uh, other conditions then, uh, as in most other uh, countries, if you are uh, legally not deemed eligible, then the NHS should be asking you to contribute, given that you won't have been doing uh, prospectively through taxes. That's obviously ultimately, in this country, a question which is settled by parliament and by government rather than by the NHS itself. We're a publicly accountable uh, health system. More broadly, I think as you see uh, the rollout of UHC, I mean, there are different design choices for uh, particularly middle-income countries. We've talked a bit about this. Uh, are you uh, trying to principally protect people from catastrophic healthcare costs, in which case you will be uh, covering uh, expensive uh, inpatient care, or are you trying to use your uh, rupees or uh, other uh, uh, local investment uh, to boost health, in which case primary care uh, is obviously the foundational investment. And so you really want to do both. You're trying to do financial protection and uh, good value uh, health care, which then gets you into questions that aren't necessarily about the financing mechanism, be it through some form of uh, government structured risk pools or through the labor market, but are also often about geography. And geography boils down to a question as to whether you can get the right health care workforce uh, into rural areas in or into uh, low income uh, urban areas. And so I think the whole sort of human capital agenda, uh, the workforce agenda for UHC uh, is uh, somewhat underexplored relative to the debates around financing mechanisms in order to drive some of the inequalities reduction in access to care that your question gets at. Rob, maybe just a brief question applies on the other parts of the world. Yes, and, and well, and I think it's, it's all in the name, really. Universal health coverage means universal and really should cover everyone. And, and what you're seeing around the world is that different governments are taking different approaches to this, and it's a hugely political decision. But the, the good thing is that there's a number of middle low income countries are taking a very progressive line to say no you know we're, we're all on this planet together and people should get health services so countries like thailand and bangladesh are having very progressive policies towards this um, i think it's very unfortunate the current government has has been sort of imposing upfront charges and and sort of putting blocks on on people getting um, access to nhs services but you're even seeing in the united states places like um, california that, that gavin Newsom. Uh, the new uh, governor of California has said that he's going to make sure that all undocumented migrants into California get free health care, wi which is wi very interesting, potentially, that, that uh, United, uh, a state in the United States is taking a more progressive line than, than the UK on this. But it's a political issue, and I, I think this is true of universal health coverage. It's as much about politics as it is about technical aspects, and if you're really concerned about universal coverage, you have to get involved in the politics. Okay. I've been warned I've had a leftist bias because I'm <laughs> angled over this side of the room. So I'm going to take this uh, question over here, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, please, yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, thank you. My name is Nina Bernarding. I'm the director of the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy. And my question ties actually quite nicely into the, the previous question. Um, and I was wondering what, what you think, what the private sector, what role the private sector can play when we talk about health services that are politically contested. And obviously, I'm thinking about reproductive rights, but also health services for queer people. And we're seeing a global pushback against reproductive rights. We just had the US threatening to veto a UN resolution because it included uh, the sentence on service, uh, reproductive health services for survivors of sexualized violence and conflict. Um, so I'm just wondering what do you think what the private se sector can play and also how the cooperation then works with, with international organizations like the World Health Organization. That was a question to whom? Anyone in particular? No. <laughs> Anyone want to go on this? Go on to the private sector and touch on this? Or Michelle? Or, uh, I'll sure. oh, go ahead. I mean, <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll kick off. I mean, and again, I, I think it comes back to the definition of universal health coverage. You know, that, that um, everyone gets the health services they need and, and where uh, vulnerable groups and marginalized groups are being excluded, then that isn't right. And I, I think it's the beauty of universal health coverage. It, it brings the politics into the health systems debates, you know, that, that you can see that if there is a vulnerable group of the population that is being denied access to services that are going to improve their health, that that's wrong. And that, that gives, I think, civil society and the legal system opportunities to, to challenge that. So, and again, that's a classic example of, of, you know, where US policy at the moment is taking, trying to take the world away from universal health coverage and that we collectively should um, resist that. Yeah, well, I, th I think the private sector has a role in that political debate, right? And obviously, you know, we can engage, you know, very capably um, a as a 
member of the U.S. populace and in terms of those sort of conversations. So I, I agree wholeheartedly. This is a, really a political discussion. The role of the private sector is very much as you know, a political constituent. Uh, there's an opportunity to actually have a very close dialogue on those sort of issues. Michelle? Yeah, that's, um, I, I do agree with what has been said, and that's why we put a lot of emphasis on primary health care. Because primary health care means having quality care next to you and accessible to even the most vulnerable um, people. It makes a huge difference for women and children because they're the ones who benefit primarily from it. And that can include a number of services also at, at really ground level close to the people. And that's where we can make a difference. And you can work with government services, you can work with um, the private sector, you can work a lot with community workers. Uh, and there's, there's a lot that can be done. And that is actually being done in the field trying to answer those needs. Uh, there's a question from the back. Yeah, please, yeah. Hi, uh, Walter Hernandez from UCL. I have a quick question. This is kind of bringing the conversation to developing countries. So what, what would you think would be the effects, for example, making healthcare from a public good into a private good? This is, uh, for example, in a developing country in which you might have like 60% of the population living in poverty, which seems to be the case of a country like Honduras in this case. Well, uh, sorry, no, go, go ahead, go ahead, Sam. Uh, I mean, I think the starting, uh, I think you have to, you have to begin by looking at the starting conditions in each country. And although there's some pattern recognition, there are some quite significant differences based on the uh, sort of socio-political and economic construct. And so in a lot of low-income countries, as we know, uh, most health expenditure is currently out of pocket uh, and is heavily geared towards uh, expensive delivery systems often in urban areas and rural populations are exposed to significant financial shocks. And so the question there is how do you sort of, if that's your starting point, how do you then get more risk pooling and equity uh, into the system? And there are you know, a variety of journeys that uh, different countries have taken, but the, I think the fundamental point is uh, a pay-as-you-go out-of-pocket uh, health system is not a sustainable answer uh, for any country looking out over the decade or, uh, ahead or, or beyond. And hence you then get into, when we talk about universal coverage, what's the optimal way of creating those risk pools and those equitable uh, sharing of financing between, between populations. Uh, I mean, I think the other thing to say, however, is that that is not just a discussion about the way a health service in a country works. There are a lot of population health risks that if we just focus on the health services aspects, uh, it can almost be diversionary activity. So, you know, the fact is in um, uh, large parts of uh, India, China, other uh, uh, countries, um, air pollution is an enormous contributor, together with basic sanitation problems, to avoidable mortality. Uh, and so, actually, we need to be having a conversation, you know, the sort of new slogan is planetary health. Uh, it's about uh, moving to uh, zero carbon. Uh, and if we don't do that, then we can have whatever health services we like uh, in these countries. But actually, uh, we will still be dealing with avoidable mortality off the scale for years to come. David, maybe. Yeah. Well, to, to pick up that point, obviously, over two, three hundred years, we slowly started a world development process, which happened to be focused in the UK to some extent for special reasons. And we haven't done badly, but it's been painfully slow. We've got the opportunity with a combination of both technology, new biological sciences, etc., and better understanding of politics, human interaction, to do better. If we work together to achieve that end, is it in historical sequence when you've got no infrastructure, when you've got no, no pattern of care, of course you begin with out of pocket and things. As societies grow more depth but in all sorts of resources, they have the capacity to do in universal health care. To get back to private public relationships, the capitalism which existed in help Britain lift off in the 1800s is dead unregulated private sector capitalism, the concept that I think even people like Jeremy Corbyn may live with now of capitalism as was, or the private sector versus the public sector as was, is gone. We live in a regulated environment, but some paths are better done 
with a market like set of incentives. Some tasks are be much better done with public funding, although public funding has its own risks. I'd say in the UK, we probably slightly underrig the healthcare funding issues. And I think Simon might actually privately agree. Um, the course of the exigencies around politicians not wanting to raise taxes on the one hand and make big promises on the other. Okay, um, Robin. Sorry, now I'll come to you. Thanks very much, uh, Robin Hood of Chatham House. Uh, a question maybe more to Simon uh, and Michael to start with, or Mike, um, just as a non-health person, Technology is providing amazing advances, as you noted, in healthcare. So where does the kind of cost versus saving cost um, meet or benefit? A lot of these new, car new technologies are going to be amazingly expensive. You've just talked about the choices the NHS has to make. But we are moving into an era of personalized medicine, uh, preventive medicine, an opportunity to really make it cheaper. So I just, I'd love to know where we are on the cycle. Maybe each medicine is different. But how do you see that balance between opportunity and cost that technology is bringing, especially given the pressures on public uh, budgets? And then maybe a bit more to Rob, Michelle, and David. I was struck by David's comment, uh, uh, price higher in rich markets than in poorer markets. And a lot of the debate you heard yesterday was on carbon uh, and the cost of carbon and whether certain countries should be paying a higher cost right now um, in making the adaptation. I mean, how, how on earth does one do pricing higher in rich markets and the others. I mean, that is such a political call. Um, how, how do you regulate global equality? I just, uh, it was a nice statement. I wasn't quite sure where it could be done. Sam, do you want to come on? Okay, well, on, the, on, the, on the first point, uh, Robert, our ability to uh, afford healthcare uh, continues to increase, not just because the overall size of economies grow, but also because the composition of household spending changes. So in 1957, uh, just uh, you know, nine years after the NHS was founded, we were spending in this country uh, 43 pence uh, in each pound of household income on uh, clothes and food. Uh, now we're spending 21 pence. Uh, in 1957, we were spending six pence of every pound of household income on tobacco. Uh, now, on average, we're spending one penny. So the composition uh, of a growing pie changes. That creates headroom, and that's one of the reasons why, as every country gets richer, uh, they choose to spend more on healthcare, positive income, elasticity of demand in the economic jargon. So the question is, how do we get the most, uh, and that's almost determined uh, sort of independently of actually what's happening inside a particular healthcare system. Some countries are spending more than you'd predict given the size of their economy on healthcare, the US being the obvious outlier, some countries spending less. Uh, the UK at uh, points in time has uh, been uh, below that, uh, that uh, regression line. Uh, but uh, within the pot, you then have to get maximum bangs for your buck. Uh, as it happens, productivity in the English NHS has been growing uh, very fast. The last year, uh, the Office of National Statistics has shown that uh, NHS productivity has been growing by 3%, three times faster than the rest of the economy. Uh, so a lot of that, however, we've got to repurpose where we're getting our productivity gains from. And some of that will be the particular gains you get from medical innovation. So, you know, a new class of medicines has come along. We are realistically, uh, over the next several years, going to be able to eliminate hepatitis C, a uh, disease uh, that uh, has previously been latent, and that will be gone. Uh, you know, the year the NHS was set up, we had 33,000 hospital beds across England uh, full of people with tuberculosis. Now we have essentially none. Uh, so the, the, the disease composition changes, the technologies that have been produced not only inside healthcare, but the spillover from other investments, general purpose technologies. I mean, we are moving to a multi-channel digital environment for healthcare in most industrialized countries. We are not going to be paying as part of a healthcare system for the costs of the iPhone uh, in my pocket. Uh, so we will be able to piggyback off uh, some of those investments. So frankly, I have no reason for thinking that the, uh, the rate of innovation and the affordability of that innovation is going to give us a bigger crunch over the uh, next decade than it has done over the last uh, seven. Maybe just one person on the differential pricing thing, uh, Michelle, or? Uh, no, actually what I wanted to, to react on is something a bit Technology. different. Okay. We always consider health as a cost. But I would like to say that health is also an investment. And we, for example, we've calculated that in low and middle income countries, if we implement the triple billion by 2023, that may generate two to 4% economic growth for the country. So that's also 
um, an investment for the future and the capacity for the countries to grow. Um, if we um, if we look at, um, I mean, there's a number of areas in the health workforce, for example. We know that we have a gap at the moment. We need 18 million more health workers uh, by 2030. And that uh, also health work workforce is, is um, can leverage economic growth. So there are many ways in which I think we have to look at health also in this way. Oh, yeah, Simon, sorry. Well, please. I just wanted to completely reinforce what you've just said. Um, we measure healthcare systems generally by looking at the flow of healthcare treatments, the sort of clicks of the turnstile, the numbers of patients treated each year. What we don't do is look at the change in the balance sheet of health right. risk. And if we began to measure changes, positive and negative, in the amount of health risk that a population was holding, uh, which of course will be the future uh, cost burden facing the healthcare system, then I think that would make, lead us to make different kind of investment decisions on a wider array of public policy uh, topics, not just within the healthcare system itself. And just to kind of a specific uh, sort of fact to illustrate that point, uh, it has been uh, estimated that in the uh, northern region of England, the so-called northern powerhouse uh, zone, one third of the productivity gap between uh, the northeast and the northwest and the rest of England is attributable to higher rates of ill health. So to the extent we were able to invest to tackle that, we would see a spillover multiplier economic benefit. Rob, just one brief, brief word perhaps on the pri differential pricing issue. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I, I, I was just wanted to follow up if I could <laughs> on, on, on <laughs> Simon's point. No, I, I think it's You've lost a panel, Andrew, at this point. Really it's important. a runaway panel. I, I think that, that <laughs> we as societies have to recognise that as populations age, we are going to have to spend more money on health. We, we shouldn't necessarily be hiding this as a bad thing. And economists say that it's a luxury good, that as societies age and... and um, um, these diseases um, impact more people. We will need to do this. My, my parents are in their late 80s, and, and you know that they, I sometimes think, almost live at the GPs, you know, because they are treating lots of different uh, symptoms. But that's what I'm really glad that they get that care. I mean, it's been a little while since my 89-year-old father has been snowboarding, but, but, you know, he wants to be able to read the newspapers and lead a, a healthy life. And I think if we can be swathing politicians that it's in society's interest that we do keep people living happier lives and being healthier in, into old age. That, that's a good thing. So we shouldn't be forever saying that we need to minimize health costs. Okay, I'm going to be ruthless in taking back control as chair, because um, coffee awaits, sorry. But th there are, you know, I hope all our panelists will linger around for the next uh, few minutes at least so you can network informally. I just, very, very briefly, I'm just going to ask each of you savagely, you know, name the one country that you think does have the best model of healthcare with the balance between public and private potentially and certainly with the best outcomes for its patients. Simon, I wonder what you'd say. I not think that's a long a, answer. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 it, Short. It, the question is the wrong one. Um, <laughs> I'm leaving now. No, no country <laughs> has I'll got answer. it right. And uh, I'll answer. But we can learn from elements of each. Okay. No, I, I agree wholeheartedly with the answer. I mean, the, the simple reality: there is there is no perfect answer right now. We're Val not there yet. Value, value for money: high-income country, the UK. Middle-income country, Thailand. Low-income country, probably Rwanda. You can always go to Chatham House for a clear, a clear answer. Michelle. <laughs> I'm afraid I have to skip that. We have 194 member states, and I don't want to have Very 193 <laughs> angry member states when I come back. <laughs> David, last word. I think France, Germany, Sweden are doing rather better than us on a number of things, but we're not doing badly. And, of course, we've got the benefit of relative wealth, at least at the moment. A good, a good international perspective to finish on. So please come back here for 11.15 after refreshments and do thank our panel. <laughs>